Europe and uh, it was an amazing experience. I got to visit India when my friends got married in India. I, um, I've never been to Greece. I've been to, unfortunately, I would love to go to Greece. I'd love to go to the Czech Republic. I've been to um, Italy and I've been to, where else have I been? Af I've been to met multiple countries in Africa and throughout Europe. So this is so, this is so amazing. Oh, from Iran, that's amazing. Oh, and you're in Prague. Wow, that's wonderful. <laughs> I, one of my good friends is here, a fellow with me and she's from Iran. That's, that's wonderful. Yeah. You, let me know if you would like me to start sharing. I'm happy we to do can. that. Yeah, I'll make just a quick introduction for everyone. Uh, really quick. One second. So I can also share my slides. Just for a brief introduction. Honestly, we've already <laughs> kind of sort of Go ahead. <laughs> met each other. So that's wonderful. Lorraine, um, wow, that's a wonderful people from all over. This is so cool. I feel sometimes like I have absolutely no <laughs> technological knowledge <laughs> whatsoever. You're doing but... wonderfully well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I think we can begin. Thank you everyone for joining us today on another UIMS clinical series. Today we have with us uh, lovely <laughs> Dr. Vader, as she has already introduced herself. Uh, she's an award-winning internal medicine board certified physician and as well a hematology and oncology fellow. She's also the developer of the SMILE scale, which is basically a scale that helps patients as well as physicians to prioritize their health. It is a scale wildly used both in the UK and in the US in schools and clinics. And today she's here with us to discuss about the importance of compassion and social determinants of health, as well as social justice and humanism uh, in medicine. We are more than honored to have you today. Thank you so much for giving us your time. We are uh, very excited to hear what you have to tell us. And without further ado, I think we can we can begin. I will stop sharing my screen so you can go ahead and share yours. And thank you so much for giving us your time. Well, thank you so much for that kind introduction. Oh my goodness, that was so kind of you. I am um, so happy to be here. I'm in the middle of my clinical day right now. I'm a Hemonc fellow, so I am seeing consults, hematology and oncology consults here in our hospital. I'm in working in our safety net hospital here in Indianapolis, Indiana, in the United States. And I'm just so thrilled. This is so neat that we can connect via Zoom and that I can get to know some of you. And that is just wonderful. I'm gonna have the chat box pulled up over here in my screen that you won't be able to see, but know that I'm looking at it. And if there's questions that come up, at any time, I'm happy to really have this be a useful conversation for you, however that looks. And so you can stop me at any time and we can just chat. So today we're gonna to talk about humanism in medicine. So what is that? Humanism in medicine to me is really seeing patients as human beings, as real people, as, as individuals who have stories. And when we care about um, patients as a whole human being, we essentially have to care about social justice, right? Because you're gonna have patients from all parts of the world, all walks of life. Um, and it's really important, at least for me, when I think about um, humanism medicine, it's really this umbrella of connection to social justice. And so I'm gonna share with you a few things that I've learned in my own training. So I've been through undergrad and medical school and residency training. I'm now in my three-year fellowship um, to become a subspecialist. And I know our training systems look different, but really at the end of the day, we are here because we wanna take care of people and we want to do a good job doing that. And we want it to be meaningful for us. And we wanna have high quality lives too, as we do this work. So we're gonna talk about all those things today. So I don't, has, have you, has this come across yet in your training? But we know that empathy actually declines as you go throughout training. So you start out, you're really, this group of people in this room, you're highly intelligent, highly altruistic, you care about human beings, you're going into this work because you want to right, take care of people. And unfortunately, we've learned that it, empathy actually gets trained out of us that when you start medical school, you have a higher level of empathy than when you graduate. And as you go throughout training, that empathy can actually decline. And I felt this in myself. I felt this in my own residency training where you know I felt that I just wasn't uh, being the doctor or showing the compassion that I wanted to, because you're gonna see a ton of patients in your time. You're gonna see a thousand, you're gonna witness thousands of doctors taking care of patients, right? And there's no doubt that um, this is a uh, this is a an apprenticeship profession, right? We learn to be doctors by watching other doctors, 
And so I'm going to compile for you everything that I have found to try to bring back empathy in my own life and to show compassion to my patients. So, and we've had, how many lectures have we had? Hundreds of lectures where they're like throwing up images of bloody things and all sorts of grossness. I want this, this lecture, I put a whole bunch of beautiful images up here just because I think we, it helps us all just to see nature and to be, uh, to encounter a bit of peace as part of our day too. So let's talk about the compassion crisis. There's a great book called Compassionomics. It's a phenomenal book. It essentially goes through all the research about compassion. And really the summary of this book is this. So at least half of patients in the United States, and I bet this is true around the world, but half of patients believe that physicians are just not compassionate. Um, more than half of physicians actually say, you know what, I just don't have time to be compassionate. That's just not, I just don't have time for that in my day. I'm seeing too many patients in clinic and I just don't have time for that. And I feel that, right? I see yesterday in clinic, I saw um, 10 patients within three hours, and they were, some of them had brand new diagnosis of cancer. Some of them were follow-up visits. Many of them did not speak English as their first language. And so we're dealing with translators and using a electronic Marty to try to, try to um, translate. And so there's all sorts of barriers to, uh, that we feel, So how do we actually show compassion? And then we, as physicians, uh, we miss more than two thirds, about 70% of those opportunities to show compassion. This means, you know, you are, see if you see a patient in front of you who is in distress and maybe uh, you, some of you, have you rotated through the hospitals yet? You can put in the chat, you know, where are you? Have you, are you seeing patients in the hospitals? Are you witnessing other doctors? Have you had clinical experiences? You can say, uh, if, if that's true for you, you can put that in the chat box. But when I was a medical student, so at least here in the United States, it's this hierarchy. So it's kind of where you're a medical student and then you have a resident and you have a higher level resident, you have a fellow, then you have your attending. So at least here in the United States, it's, there's, there's this culture of you know, different structures of power. Is that true where you are as well? Where you've kind of got, um, so some of you are seeing patients at least a few times a month and um, you have, I see some of you nodding your heads that yes, you kind of have this structure of power. And at least here, you're attending, which is like our, the, the doctor who's finished with their training, they, kind of lead the show. They are the ones who kind of come in the room and talk. And if you see a patient that's in distress uh, and you're attending, your, your leader, the leader of the team doesn't immediately show compassion to that person, whether that's through putting a hand on the shoulder or offering a tissue or pausing to acknowledge the emotion or just providing support, then you know we're witnessing that. We're witnessing a ton of moments where patients are in distress, but there's no action given. And that's kind of a normal thing that I see in my day, not because those doctors are bad people, just because, right, they're trying to get, they're trying to say what they need to say, and they're, they're sometimes in their own heads, they may not always pay attention and see what's going on around them. And so we see all these opportunities to show compassion that are just missed. And I've seen this so many times, I've missed so many opportunities to show compassion. And so I'm trying to figure out how can I put this back into my life? We also, we also know that compassion, you know, you might ask yourself, well, it's, it's a nice idea. It's a nice idea to show patients that we care about them, but does it actually matter? And there's some good science behind this. So when doctors show compassion, we're actually more likely to get the diagnosis right. This is typically because we are listening a bit better. We are connecting with our patients. We know them a bit more as people. So we're actually more likely to get the diagnosis right. Because of this, we need fewer diagnostic tests, um, fewer referrals to specialists. And um, this is actually very helpful to the patients and to us because it reduces the cost. Here in the United States, we have astronomical medical costs. We have lots of kind of unnecessary tests and referrals. So we're less likely to do those things. We're less likely to make medical errors. And because of that, there's fewer malpractice claims. Is malpractice a big thing where you are as well? I'm sure I think around the world it is, right? These are people's lives at stake that we're taking care of. And so... Um, you know, it's important that we get things right and, and showing compassion can help with that. And, and for all of those reasons, it can decrease our healthcare costs. And then when doctors show compassion, we actually know that patients are more likely to take their medicines. Patients that have HIV are more likely to adhere to those, um, those antiretrovirals if they feel like their doctor actually cares about them. Uh, we know it can actually decrease patient anxiety and it can reduce PTSD in the ICU. Have any of you rotated through the ICU yet? You've seen patients with breathing tubes. They have, you know, this morning. So I have a patient right now who's in the ICU. She, yesterday she was intubated. So she's got a breathing tube now. She's got a central line in her neck. She's got dialysis running. 
She's got medicines to sedate her um, that are dripping into her veins. She's on strong antibiotics. She's on a medicine called a presser. As you've learned about pressers kind of squeeze your blood pressure, right? Vasopressin and norepinephrine and epinephrine. And we have a whole host of them. And there's a ton of stuff going on around her. And um, it can be very traumatic to be in the ICU. Some of you might've actually been patients in the ICU yourself. And it's a, it's a very traumatic experience and it can lead to post-traumatic stress disorder because of that. You're getting poked and you don't know what's going on. Sometimes procedures are happening and you don't understand. Sometimes there's, right, there's even codes. So code blue where they're compressing their chest and all sorts of things. And so when we actually go in a room and we, we assume that the patient hears us when they're in the ICU, when we talk to them like a person, we explain to them what, what we're doing, that actually can reduce the trauma they experience from being in the hospital. We know that patients who are diabetic, they have better blood glucose control. They're more likely to actually check their blood glucose and to take their medicines if they feel like they've connected with their doctor and they have someone who cares about them. And then they even found in one study a shorter duration of a common cold. So I just want to highlight to you that these findings are not insignificant. This really is important. And you're medical students now and you may feel, okay, well, I'm part of this team. Maybe you don't feel valued. Maybe you're, maybe you're kind of, you're shadowing and you're, you're going along and you're learning and that's valuable, but you might actually say, you know, what am I doing that's valuable to the team? And um, I think showing compassion to your patients in the here and now from the very moment that you interact with another person, showing them that you care about them, being intentional about that, it can have real benefits for their medical care. And so remember that as you're going through that, whatever level you are, it doesn't matter. Compassion matters to your patients. We also know that it helps us too. So compassion buffers the effect of stress. I know that when I'm running, rushing through my day and seeing a ton of people, and yesterday happened to be a very busy day. I was in clinic, and then I was seeing a whole bunch of patients in the hospital. And it's so easy to just feel like, wow, this is just, I'm just checking the boxes. I've got to write these notes, and I've got to see these people, and I've got to get the work done. But if you really just take a little extra moment to connect with a person, and I'm going to walk you through what that looks like in my life, um, we know that it actually helps bring back that sense of meaning in our work. Oh, this is why I'm working these hours. This is why I'm spending all of this time and effort and you're studying and you're in clinic and you're, you're trying to do all of these things and reconnecting with your patients can often reconnect you to the work. And that's been true in my life too. And so know that compassion helps us too, not just our patients, not, not just healthcare costs in the healthcare system, but there's benefits for all of us. So, and I'm seeing here in the chat, um, many of you have seen, uh, some of you, and meant probably many of you have seen patients with COVID in the ICUs and you're um, experiencing that. And often with patients that have COVID, at least my experience working in the COVID ICUs last year was that these patients are isolated and they didn't have family members at their bedside and they, they didn't have the ability to have even one visitor and the healthcare workers, we were kind of trying to get out of the room as quickly as possible, right? And so just showing compassion and, and taking that extra step is really helpful for your patients. Okay, so how do, you, how do we cultivate compassion? What does this actually look like in our lives? Um, there's five, five things that I kind of do that have helped me. We're gonna go through each one. So getting to know our patients, um, communicating clearly, um, seeking those opportunities so that we just don't miss them taking care of ourselves. I'm gonna walk you through and ask you to do a self-assessment with a smile scale with me. And then a few other things to cultivate our empathy. So the first thing is simple, just getting to know your patients. I know this seems like a very basic thing, but it's very easy to just rush through your day as a doctor, never really knowing anyone, not knowing your nurses, not knowing your coworkers, not knowing your patients. And then we set ourselves up for all these kind of superficial relationships where we don't really know anyone very well. And this can be very, this can actually be very isolating. As you're going through medical training, you might personally feel like it's an isolating experience. Um, but just knowing that um, when you get to know your patients, that connection is really helpful for you. So, and just I, something before I walk in each patient's room, um, you know, as I'm kind of washing my hands or sanitizing my hands, I take a moment just to pause. And I remind myself that this is a person, they have a story, they have much more than their diagnosis. And I want to get to know a bit of that. Who are they beyond their diagnosis? And so um, maybe you can put something in the chat. I'd love for you to share with us. If you met a patient and they've had 
uh, a story that they've told you about who they are as a person that has been meaningful to you. Um, I had a patient a couple weeks ago and he uh, came into his chemotherapy appointment and he was two days late for it. And I kind of asked him, you know, why was that? You know, what was the reason that you were, you didn't come in a couple days ago? And he actually told me that he was his nephew had uh, had died and he was clearing the land for his memorial. He was clearing the land for his brother who um, couldn't do it himself because his brother had a, had a disability. And so he was working hard mowing the grass and he was so exhausted the next day, he spent the whole next day in bed. But this, this patient cared so much about his nephew and his brother that he spent a whole day doing that, missing his own chemotherapy. And you know that said a lot to me about who he was as a person. I, and I, I see that so many of you are, are kind of in, uh, putting this in the chat, but uh, especially when taking care of their histories and they go off on a tangent, right? And that's kind of how do we actually bring them back from a tangent. But the way that I like to do this with my patients is I'm meeting them in clinic. I say, tell me something about yourself that's more than, more than this illness. Sometimes I say, what do you like to do for fun? You know, and it kind of surprises me. I, have, I had asked a patient that what he liked to do for fun yesterday, and he said, I'm very active and I volunteer at all these places. And so I got to learn that about him. And your patients will share incredibly personal stories about themselves. And when you get to know them, it makes your job more meaningful. And it's actually going to be beneficial for them and for you so that when you see them every day after that, it's not just walking into the room of a patient that has chest pain. You're walking into the room of a patient that you know their name, you know a little bit about them, and that's more meaningful for you. And it's gonna give you more value to your work. Okay, the next thing is communicate with intention. I'm gonna share some really simple things that I have, you know, watching thousands of doctors, I've kind of found what do I think are the best ones? What are the best ways to communicate? And I don't know if they talk about this in your medical school or not, but for me, they really, uh, we didn't have a lot of lectures about communication. Is this something that you study? Not, not so much, maybe a little bit. These are kind of basic things, but things that I think are often missed when I witness when I witness other clinical encounters, it's amazing how um, I don't always see these things happen. So uh, yeah, some of you are saying we had a few, maybe not much. I didn't really have much either. I would, um, I would just say, pay attention. When you see something done really well, you're gonna see thousands of encounters. What, what is done well and what is not done well? I once had a doctor walk in the room of patients and he didn't even look at them in the eye and he would just say a few things to them and then he would walk out the door and uh, pay Patients had this feeling of not being seen and not being heard and not being valued. And I think that was a really, that was really difficult for me. And you're going to, you're going to see people that do things extremely well. And so how do you, how do you actually uh, create and craft the type of doctor you want to be? So here are a few things for me. Most, most basic of all is just sitting down. You're going to have, sometimes have a hard time finding a chair or finding a stool in a hospital. That's not always possible. If you have a patient that's in distress, you can squat down next to their bedside and you can put your hand on their shoulder. You can hold their hand. If I have patients that are in extreme amount of pain or distress or frustration, it's amazing the act of sitting down, how much that can diffuse those emotions. Just, I like to put my stool or chair at a lower eye level than your patients, because remember, you're highly educated. You have you speak multiple languages, you have so, you have so much um, maybe that your patients don't have, including money and status. If when we walk in a patient's room and we're in a white coat and we're well-dressed, we're not kind of stripped of our dignity, we're not in a hospital gown, we are not in a hospital bed, right? That dichotomy of kind of standing over a patient in a white coat, that can be really intimidating. So just that simple act of sitting down is just you know, saying, I'm here with you. And when you sit down, patients actually feel that you spend three times um, more time with them than you actually do. So even if you're short on time, the simple act of just sitting down and slowing down a little bit can be really helpful. Next thing is simple, just make eye contact. You learn this in first grade. It's not something that I think it's something all of us um, do, but just being cogn cognizant of that. And I like to give the first 45 to 60 seconds just to my patient. We know that, does anyone know, have you come across the study yet, how frequently we interrupt patients? I don't know if anyone has come across this yet. So it's um, about 11 seconds. Yep, let, let, let's take less than a minute. So it's less than a minute for sure. It's like 11 to 15 seconds. The patient says one thing, 
and we interrupt them and they say something else and we constantly interrupt them. And of course, nobody really likes to be interrupted. And uh, so give your patient the first 45 to 60 seconds. Most patients, again, not all, because some will kind of go off on tangents and tell you all sorts of stories and you might have to redirect those patients. Most patients will tell you what they need to say in about 45 seconds. What, what brings you into the clinic? What brings you into the emergency room? How can I help you today? You know, that way you have it framed already why they're there and what they need for you, um, from you. So I would say just start with that. That's been really helpful for me. I just ask them, you know, maybe how are you? What brings you here? And I kind of sit down and listen. And it gives this whole sense that that whole thing takes less than a minute, but it gives this sense of I'm here to listen. I'm here to care about you. And I've demonstrated that within less than a minute. And then I may only have five minutes with a person, but if I, that first minute is completely spent on them, and then I can ask all those follow-up questions. Well, do you have nausea and vomiting? Are you having diarrhea? Do you have headaches? Do you have all these other things? And I can fill in all the blanks. And I think that that helps our patients to feel heard and to know that we're not just rushing through the day. Um, of course, to show you with your significant other, right? How do you show a person you're listening? You're looking at them, you're nodding your head, you're asking follow-up questions. You're not, they're not having to repeat themselves a hundred times because you've listened. And that's, that's a valuable skill to not be distracted for the period of time you're with a patient. A really, really hard thing, really hard thing because we're constantly interrupted, but it's an important thing to try to not interrupt as much as possible. And then just using simple terms, right? So you are, you are learning another language to be able to speak with your patients in the hospital. I mean, that's incredible. That's so difficult that you are, right? You're trying to communicate with your patients and certainly there's going to be communication barriers there. But the more that you can translate your, the words you know from your English education into, uh, right, you're learning other languages to communicate with your patients, try to find simple ways to communicate that and that's going to help your patients. And, right, so if my patient is, has pain in their liver and it's because their liver capsule is expanding because of a tumor in their liver and they've got back pain because of the compression fracture from their cancer and they have brain metastases that's causing visual changes and all sorts of things. It'd be, some doctors will say, oh, well, your hepatic capsule is enlarging and it's causing, right? And, um, or your, 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 your T2 spinal fracture, right? And, and um, I had a really good doctor once that said to me, you know, we don't need any of that. Just say, it's the cancer. The pain you're feeling here, it's the cancer. The pain in your back, it's the cancer, right? The more that you can take complex things and make them simple for your patients, my goodness, that is going to be a gift to them. It's a gift to their families because patients will not feel like they can ask you questions sometimes. They might, they don't want to feel stupid. They don't want to feel, right? They don't want to feel that they're not um, smart enough. So they might not ask you to clarify when they don't understand. And then just simply acknowledge how someone feels, right? You know, there will be times and many times where your patients are going to be yelling at you they're gonna be standing over you and they're gonna be upset about something or they're going to dismiss you or they're gonna be frustrated or they're gonna be crying. They're gonna express, right? Having an illness is awful, right? And we're helping patients navigate their illnesses as they go through their lives. And we're, we're witnesses to that and we're guides. We help guide them along this path of having illness, trying to get them better, trying to help them feel better. But there's all sorts of emotions they're gonna feel along the way and that's normal. So simply acknowledging how a person feels, you know, saying, you know, I know this is really frustrating. Um, it's normal to feel angry about this, uh, you know, and just that just diffuses the anger right away. So if I'm sitting down and a patient is standing over me yelling at me, right? Okay, so first of all, you don't ever, you, if you feel unsafe, you get out of the room. If, you know, patients should not be disrespecting you. But if they're, you know, if they're just upset about a diagnosis, um, it's easy to, to just diffuse that anger by saying that emotion out loud and keeping your voice calm and just being present in that moment, if you feel safe. Um, and then just be respectful out, outside of the room. Know that patients can hear you right outside of the room. Um, especially, this is very, this, we've had at my hospital, we have a lot of uh, transgender patients. And I think some of our attendings are still trying to figure out how to use pronouns respectfully and um, terms. And, and, and um, this is true for our transgender patients, but for every patient, right? How we speak about a patient in the room should be the same way we speak about them outside the room. So just being respectful of their dignity and who they are as a human being. And I'm just going to uh, touch base in the chat here. So I see one good tip we are recommended is starting a conversation about something at the patient's bedside table. For example, oh, that's a, is, who is this here in this photo? Uh, this is your grandchild. That's a great idea. I love that. And I think that really helps them, um, 
you to see the person as a whole human being. And, and uh, when you are on, if you're doing any telehealth chatting or you're doing virtual visits, the cool thing about that is you're not seeing a patient removed in their, um, they're not in the hospital, they're in their own home. And so you get to see their families kind of running around often. You're gonna see people coming in and out of the window of, of the view you're seeing. You're gonna see just the environment in which they, they live and work. And that's really incredible. So uh, those are some of the opportunities. Uh, those were some of the tips that I had found. And then finding opportunities to show compassion. As I mentioned, we miss a ton of opportunities to show compassion. They happen and we miss them and they happen again and we miss them. So just pay attention. The simple act of just paying attention, that is so valuable. If you're, if you're uh, in the hospital and you are paying attention, right, you're gonna be such a gift to your patients. And, and don't fault yourself if you're in your residency and you're in your fellowship and right, it's often my medical students now who are on my medical team who see things that I don't see because I can't see them in the same way. I try to, I try to bring that back and I try to, wow, okay, that person is really having a lot of pain, right? But it's often my medical students who, who perceive things. Um, and then also, if you're the one kind of cognitively thinking through things and talking, know that you're going to miss things. And there's going to be members of your team that might be paying attention. So I was in a uh, pancreatic cancer clinic a couple months ago, and there was a man that was newly diagnosed metastatic pancreatic cancer, which carried this awful, awful prognosis. And we were my, my attending and I, he was talking about the risks and benefits of chemotherapy. And then this patient's wife was sitting in the chair across from him. And I was just observing and listening and um, kind of just, you know, sitting in a chair. And I noticed that the, the man's wife starts crying. You know, her tears are falling into her blue mask. And it's very silent and she's trying to be stoic. But it's very clear that she is just distressed because of all this information and now facing her husband being so ill. And my attending, he's wonderful and very kind and smart and, and uh, caring, but he just didn't see it because he was so focused on making sure the patient heard the risks and benefits, right? So here's an opportunity for me, the bystander who sees it, right, to respond to that. It's fine. It's okay for me to move closer to the patient, to put my, put my hand on her shoulder, to offer her a tissue, right? Um, to acknowledge that there are emotions that are coming up. And if I'm if I am sitting in a room with a patient and these things happen, then it's absolutely okay for me to, to acknowledge that and to care about that person. And then lastly, I just want to talk about making a statement of support. So if you make a statement of support, this doesn't have to be a five minute thing. This can just be a few seconds um, for a patient. And we know through research that making a simple statement of support can really help reduce the anxiety of your patient. So you can screenshot this next, um, this next, uh, Green, they looked at this in research, but a brief statement of support can really help your patients. So something as simple as, you know, this is really difficult and it's normal to feel scared. We're going to be here with you. We're going to go through this together. We'll be here with you every step of the way, right? So your patients often feel isolated in illness. They feel, especially if they, if you have patients that have come from, I have many patients that do not have family in the city. They've come from other countries. They've come to the United States and they may not have family in the city. I have patients who are experiencing homelessness who do not have another soul in the world, right? During the COVID epidemic where, uh, oh, can you see my screen? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, my screen popped up so that I was being paused. All right, let's try this again. What happened? Okay, very good. Can you see it now? Mm, yes. You could see it the whole time and it was just me. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, wonderful. So I was in the hospital a couple of weeks ago, maybe a couple of months ago now, and I was covering the weekend. So I didn't know this patient over the week, but on Saturday I met him for the first time and he was dealing with a new diagnosis of leukemia. And he was very young, he had young kids and he had really never been sick before. And now he's facing being in the hospital for a long period of time and his family couldn't visit. So he was very stoic and we kind of had a normal conversation of, okay, this is the chemotherapy, these are the side effects, how are you feeling? And uh, you know, he, was, he said, I'm fine, I'm doing fine with all of this. And then at the very end, I said a statement, something like this, something like, you know, this is really hard what you're going through. This is a lot all at once. I want you to know that we're gonna be here to support you. We're here with you every step of the way. Just something very simple. And then I said goodbye and left. 
And then I came back on Sunday and saw him again on Sunday. And again, we asked how he was doing and, and, and so, so on and so forth. And that's, right before I left, he said, you know, what you said yesterday about being supported and not being alone, it meant so much to me. I can't express to you how much that meant to me. I've been terrified. I, I'm so afraid to tell my family um, how scared I am because I'm trying to be strong for them. I want to be around for them. And I, I'm so afraid of dying from this. And I just feel very alone because I can't tell my family those things. And so I didn't change anything, nothing medically changed. I didn't change his chemotherapy, nothing, nothing else had changed. But the simple act of making a patient feel supported is huge. If we do nothing else, just letting our patients know, especially if they have breathing tubes, they're intubated, they're in the ICU, just knowing, even if they have to physically be in a room by themselves because they, because of, um, you know, precautions related to infection, saying to them that we are here to support you. There's so much happening behind the scenes. We are monitoring your labs and your vitals. We are here to support you and we're going to help you through this. That is such a gift to your patients. So try to remember that. Okay, so now let's talk about taking care of ourselves. Um, I'm gonna introduce a tool to you uh, called the SMILE scale. And I, I wanna do this together. And the reason that I created this tool is because I had a medical degree as an intern and I knew all of the knowledge about basically how to take care of myself, but I still really wasn't able to because there's this emphasis in medical training that all of the priority is on patients. That of course patients are important. Patients are extremely important. That's why we're here is to care about patients. But our health matters too. We are human beings too. And our health is actually interconnected. When we are well, physically and mentally, uh, well, we're better able to care for our patients. We're better able to be patient. We're better able to show compassion, to be kind to our patients. And so taking care of our health is not something that is, is um, um, going to make us worse doctors because we take time to do that. It's actually going to make us better at what we do. So I'm going to introduce the smile scale to you. I know some of you are familiar with this um, and we're going to go through it here together. So the smile scale is a tool I created based on a literature search of more than 300 studies. I looked at all of the, all of, you know, what are the habits that help us stay healthy for the years to come, but also to feel good today? Because I did not need more information. I had a medical degree. I had a public health degree. I had the information, but I didn't have a system. I didn't have a way to check in with myself and make sure that I was actually prioritizing my health. Because I have a child, I have a husband, I have patients that I take care of. I have these other responsibilities in my life. And the truth is, is that we don't always take very good care of ourselves because we're trying to do all these other things for other people. But our health really matters too. And we, we deserve to have the health that we give to our patients. Okay, so this is a simple, simple check-in tool. It's got five points. I want you on a piece of paper, you can do this mentally. Um, we're gonna do this together. So the first question is regarding sleep. Am I getting seven to nine hours of sleep at night? So basically, are you getting at least seven hours of sleep? That can be last night, or you can even do it the day before. But in general, are you sleeping at least seven hours? If that answer is yes, give yourself one point. And if that answer is no, give yourself zero. And the reason that is seven hours, it's seven hours because we know that it's six hours, six and a half hours. Our organs really, it's not enough. So the natural killer cells that we learn about, those are, those are a critical function of your immune system. They're reduced by about 30% if you're getting about six hours of sleep. So your immune system is not functioning as well if you're not getting enough sleep. We know that sleep is strongly linked to your physical health. So if you're not getting enough sleep, your coronary arteries can become brittle. You can be at risk for diabetes. You can be at risk for Alzheimer's dementia because when you sleep, it helps wash away that beta amyloid protein that builds up in the setting of dementia. We know, it's, of course, it's going to be good for your immune system. So patients that don't, and, and us too, if we don't get enough sleep, our risk of cancer is more than doubled. Um, we also know that sleep is strongly linked to our mental health. So sleep deprivation, getting less than seven hours of sleep is in, increases the risk of anxiety, depression, and suicide. And for those of you who follow me on Instagram, you know that I'm a huge proponent of sleep during medical training. I, tr I strongly believe that we can still take care of patients and also ensure the adequate rest of our healthcare workforce. And I, I like to argue that it actually makes 
our patients safer because the, the risk of, of, of um, having a medical error of interpreting something incorrectly, it's much increased when we are sleep deprived because our brains need sleep. When we don't get enough sleep, so you're studying right now, you're in a period of study. We know that when you have had enough rest, you have better concentration, better attention, better problem solving skills, better memory. Sleep itself takes those memories from the prefrontal cortex, from the hippocampus to the prefrontal cortex. So it helps to consolidate those memories. So sleep is an essential component of your physical health and your mental health and of your learning. So trying to get enough sleep is gonna be so critical for you. Um, maybe you can tell me in the chat, are there things, are there reasons why um, oh, and Layla's uh, saying where I talk about sleep. Um, in the chat, let me know. Are there what are the reasons that you don't get enough sleep? And I'll share them. I'll share you. I'll share mine with you. So the reasons I don't get enough sleep in the past was that you know I thought I needed to wake up early or stay up later to study. I have a child, right? So uh, kids are. I don't know if any of you have children, but uh, children are. They can really be hard on your sleep, especially when they're little. Uh, even when they get older, right? Um, sometimes we have such busy days that by the time we get home, we want a little bit of time to relax and that time is often in the evening. And so just not getting enough sleep because we are, we are just, um, you know, wanting a little time for ourselves as well. So there's all sorts of reasons. Of course, there's medical reasons why patients don't get enough sleep. That can be sleep apnea, that can be chronic pain, that can be enlarged prostate, waking up to go to the bathroom, that could be anxiety and thoughts that are racing. I'm seeing things, some things in the chat. So just having a lot of things to do, um, being energetic during that time, being on my phone, right? So there's all that the screen time that can uh, artificially change our production of melatonin and our, our sleep-wake cycle. Um, worrying about enough sleep. I'm seeing someone say that worrying about enough sleep prevents me from getting enough sleep. Yes, for me too. So I, especially before my big test, right? I don't know if any of this, this happens to you, but I before my big board exam, you're, you're you go trying to go to bed early or at least on time and then you're thinking the whole night of like oh my gosh is my alarm gonna come on am I gonna fail this test how am I gonna do and the truth is is that you're gonna perform well because you've prepared but you're worried right there's that worry and then you can't fall asleep and then it's that frustration of not being able to fall asleep and it just becomes this cycle uh worrying about the to-do list right there's all sorts of reasons why why we don't get enough sleep okay so let's let's talk through this together what might be ways that you can do one thing to get a little bit better sleep i'm going to walk you through some things so being consistent going to sleep at the same time each night and waking up the same time each morning as much as possible that's going to anchor your sleep that's going to help you to your body can be predictable for your body your quality of sleep is going to be better your quantity of sleep is going to probably be better know that your bedroom should be like a cave it should be dark quiet and cool ideally less than you know i don't know what this is in celsius but uh, 68 degrees fahrenheit so you're you're your bedroom should be cool, like a cave. Try to keep electronics out of your bedroom as much as possible. Try not to look at that bright screen right before you go to bed. Maybe read a hard copy of a book. That's one of my favorite ways. Now I'm reading books to my daughter and that's kind of our bedtime routine. But reading a, a book at night, even just for five or 10 minutes can be a great way to um, relax. So I'm trying to think, is there one thing that you could do to kind of clean up your sleep? Um, because you're going to, um, we know that the shorter your sleep, the shorter your life. So sleep really predicts, predicts, your, predicts your longevity and it really helps you feel good in the here and now. So the better sleep you can get, the better, the more health you're gonna have, you're gonna be a better learner. So try to, try to get enough sleep as much as you can. Okay, so the next one here is move my body. Have I been physically active for 30 minutes or more? And this doesn't have to mean that you're running a marathon or doing anything crazy. Um, but just check in with yourself. Are you regularly getting physical activity? And I think this is probably the hardest one for most of us because it takes time and uh, we don't always feel like we have time, right? And for me, I know that this is the one, if I'm gonna not hit this, if I'm not gonna hit one of these things each day, it's probably gonna be the exercise because I try my best to be to, to exercise, but I, I kind of have to play it by ear. So sometimes I just set a timer on my phone in the morning and I do, maybe 10 minutes of yoga in the morning. It's nothing crazy, but I do something. And then I take the stairs as much as possible in the hospital. I'm walking throughout the hospital and trying to get my physical activity. Um, I, again, I don't know if any of you have, have children, but I try to be creative about this. So I have dance parties with my daughter. Sometimes we do um, um, cosmic kids yoga, which is like this cool like kid scene of yoga. And it can be really fun. We go outside and we play soccer. <clears throat> we like to run around and go for walks. 
this doesn't have to be mean that you're um, going crazy with your activity and causing injuries and exercising for hours and hours a day. But just trying to get some physical activity is going to make you a better learner. So when I was a medical student, that is what motivated me to exercise, is that we know that exercise increases a growth factor in your brain that helps you to actually be a better learner. So I used to use that as motivation. Okay, I don't have time to do this, but I know that exercise is actually going to help me learn better. It's going to give me more energy and it's going to make, of course, it's going to protect my cardiovascular health, reduce risk for cancer, right? It's going to make, it makes your skin look better. It helps your hair from graying, right? There's a whole bunch of longevity features that are important for exercise. But when I, I try when I try to motivate myself to exercise, it always comes to how can I help me today? And for me, that was like, okay, I'm studying for this big test. Exercise is going to be my stress reducer and it's going to help me learn. And I see uh, Camilla said, I use exercise to procrastinate. Okay. Hey, well, you're not really procrastinating. Maybe, maybe you are procrastinating a little bit, but you are also helping yourself learn. Be a better learner. So that's uh, fantastic. Okay, this next one gets to chronic stress. We all have stress, we have acute stress, we have chronic stress, and we all have different levels of stress. But no matter what, we all have stress. And um, there's all sorts of unhealthy ways that our patients are gonna cope with stress that we, right, maybe smoking or vaping or drinking alcohol or, right, um, there's all sorts of unhealthy ways that, that we as a human race have learned to cope with stress. So finding a, a technique to cope with your stress in a healthy way is really valuable. So ask yourself, you know, just take a moment to reflect. Am I regularly using healthy ways to reduce my stress? Maybe that's meditation. Maybe that's deep breathing. Maybe that's journaling. Maybe that's a form of prayer, depending on your faith. Maybe that is um, simply walking in nature. What are those things for you that help reduce your stress in a healthy way? So I came to meditation when I was a medical student, when I had had my, my daughter was eight or nine months old. And I was a huge, I was a huge skeptic. You can put in your, uh, you can put in your chat box, you know, do any of you meditate? Are you skeptic about, are you skeptical about it? How do you feel about it? Right. It's one of those things. We know that the stressors of a medical life, I'm not going to say to you, oh, well just meditate and all your stress is going to go away. That's not practical or realistic, right? Reducing the burden of work for doctors and training is the way to do that. But know that Having some type of healthy tip, healthy technique to train your mind is really helpful. Uh, I see, I'm seeing someone say, haven't figured out how to meditate properly. Well, there's no right or wrong, wrong way to do it. That's the good thing. Um, meditation is really training your mind. Like you would train your body to run a race or do some type of activity or learn a dance. You're training your mind. And that's what meditation is. So every day we have tons of thoughts and emotions coming into our mind. Oh, I suck at doing this. Oh, I'm going to fail this test oh, I, whatever, I'm distracted by this thing. You have all these thoughts and feelings that come into your mind throughout the day. And it's a really powerful tool to be able to see them come into your mind and to be able to label them to say, oh, that was a thought, that was a feeling, that was a thought, that was a feeling. And you don't have to respond to them. If you're starting to have all this negative self-talk right before an exam, right? You can, if, you, if you're training your mind in a healthy way to be able to acknowledge and to recognize, okay, I just had a very... Um, unhealthy thought I just had about myself and I don't have to respond to it. It's a very powerful tool to not allow your emotions and the thoughts that you have to spiral downhill. Um, and like I see here in the chat, trying to meditate when you can't fall asleep is a hugely important thing. That helps me too. Because if you can train your, train your mind to not respond to all those anxious thoughts that you're feeling, it can be huge. I know for me, when I, so you're in training and you're going to get to a point where you are taking care of critically ill people. Even if that's not what you're going to do for the rest of your life, you're going to be at a point where you're going to be the doctor in the hospital that you have to put a breathing tube down a person's trachea. You have to put a central line in their jugular in their neck or a femoral vein in there. And they're going to be very ill. They're right. When they need these things, they're very ill. You might have, you're going to be running a code. You might be performing CPR yourself, or you're the one that's deciding when to give epinephrine and when to, to pause. And does this, does this person have a shockable rhythm so that we can resuscitate them? And that's a really, really stressful situation. I've been in that situation so many times as a physician and I'm standing, it's, it often goes like this. You're standing at the head of the bed and I see you're holding your hands like that. I love that. Um, you're standing at the head of the bed and there's a whole bunch of people in the room and it's pretty chaotic. And the patient in front of you is not doing so well. They're decompensating and everyone's looking at you and you're the one that has to do these things. Probably, usually it's like you're bagging them 
and then you're about to get your you're about to intubate them and you're seeing their heart racing and your heart's racing and you're seeing their breathe you're seeing their oxygen level and you have to perform right you have to already perform at a high level to take these exams you're doing as you go through your training you have to perform in a different way if you're going to be if you're going to become a surgeon no matter even if you're a surgeon or not you're going to be doing some type of procedures in your training right now i do bone marrow biopsies and things right i'm not doing the things i used to have to do but to be able to reset your physiology to be able to take yourself through a breathing technique that calms you down to be able to do a brief meditation that's one minute or 30 seconds that just helps you to just okay, all this is coming at me and I don't have to respond to it. That is a hugely important skill to have. And it's not something that you can just have immediately. It's something you kind of have to train into your mind. So that's how I came to meditation because we know meditation, it actually increases serotonin in your brain. It increases GABA. GABA is that inhibitory neurochemical. So there's actually science behind that meditation can be a helpful way to you know, in the acute setting of taking care of a person, just chronically dealing with our stress can be a really helpful technique. So just think about that. There's all sorts of apps and free apps you can use on your phone. It can teach you how to do it just for five minutes a day or just five minutes a few times a week. It could be something that, you know, you, you can see if that might be a beneficial thing to add to your life. Okay, next we're going to talk about social connection. So do I take time each day to foster my relationship? So think about this. This is not connecting with 100 people. This means the one, two, or three people in your life, close friend, a partner, a family member, who are those people in your life? And are you taking time to connect with them? So if that answer is yes, it's, I mean, it's, it's a subjective thing, but you know, are you generally trying to foster those relationships, choose forgiveness, laugh together, have fun, right? Those social those social connections protect your health. So Harvard has done a study for more than 80 years it's called the Harvard Study of Adult Development. And what they found is that loneliness turns out to be really bad for your health. So loneliness is that subjective feeling of being alone, right? You can be lonely in a marriage. You can be lonely in a group of people. You can be lonely um, amongst your friends. You can also live by yourself and also feel very connected to people, right? And so um, that subjective feeling of loneliness, they estimate is uh, essentially can cut your life short by about eight years. So they, they, they call it like an equivalent risk factor as if you smoked or if you were physically inactive. So social connection is actually really important for your health. So I want all of you to, uh, you can get out your phone right now and just send a message, right? Send a message to a person that one, two or three people that are your core people. Maybe they're across the world. Maybe you haven't reached out to them in a couple of weeks because you've been busy and you're a medical student and, and there's a ton of things that get in the way of being connected with the people you care about. But just send a brief message and say, I was just thinking about you. I just want to know, thank you for supporting me. I really appreciate you. I love you. Um, you know, I hope you're doing well. Just send them a message and let them know you care about them. And maybe when you have, you finish your next exam, you have a little bit of time. Maybe you set up uh, a brief dinner that you're having virtually with them. Maybe you're actually going to just go for a, maybe you're going to integrate these other things we talked about. Maybe you're going to go for a walk in a park with a friend, you know, then you're getting your exercise and maybe some relaxation and social connection, right? Maybe you're going to have a, a good meal with someone that you care about. There's ways that you can do multiple things at once. And uh, just knowing that those relationships are going to protect you. When you have someone to rely upon during crisis, during financial crisis, during personal crisis, it's highly protective for your health. Okay, and lastly is eat to nourish. So am I eating foods that nourish my body? Foods that are grown in the ground. These are, these are things like fruits and vegetables. Um, are you having at least five servings of those today of fruits and vegetables? And we know that, you know, we learned this when we're in kindergarten. My daughter, she's watching Peppa Pig and there's this song, right, about eating her five vegetables. And we learn this when we're very young. But we know that the more plants that you eat, the healthier you're going to be. We have many um, organizations here in the United States, the American, um, American Lung Association, the American Heart Association. They talk about eating way more than five, eating actually 13 or 14 servings of, of plants a day is what protects your health. And the reason behind that is because there's antioxidants, there's phytonutrients in plants. So this is fruits, vegetables, beans, legumes, nuts, seeds, things that are real foods. They have properties that prevent DNA damage. They help with DNA repair. They help your immune system, right? They can actually slow cancer growth. So it's not just, oh, well, you're not eating the bad stuff. It's actually there's things within those foods 
that protect your health that your body needs, that your body relies upon. So the more that you can add those into your life, the healthier you're going to be, the less you know, cancer, the less heart disease, the less risk for diabetes, the less risk for dementia. So in the United States, about a third of the cancers diagnosed here could be prevented just through diet alone. Know that the things you put in your body really matter. They protect your health and uh, trying to get at least five servings a day. So for me, I go to the hospital, I wake up at early, I wake up at like five in the morning and I do a meditation and I do um, a little bit of yoga for 10 minutes with my meditation. And I'm a crazy person who then writes for an hour and a half because I love writing. And that's the only time in my life that I get to write. And now that I'm not a resident anymore, I don't have to be at the hospital at like 6.30 or 7 a.m. So I can leave my home around 7.30. And so I actually have a period of time to write. But so I, I, I then, <laughs> you know, I, um, I don't want to spend a ton of time preparing food. So what I do is I just throw things into my lunchbox. So I've got like a whole avocado and a whole bell pepper and I've got random fruits and vegetables that I just have thrown a whole package of berries and just a ton of stuff because then throughout the day when I'm hungry and I have other meals too that I eat, of course, but, and I always have nuts or some type of nut butter. I always have, you know, I always have, I always have a mug with me. I always have like hot tea that I can make. And that just allows me as I go about my day that I'm just supplementing my day with the fruits and vegetables I have. I'm the known to, I just eat bell peppers like an apple. I just don't, I don't have time to chop. We don't have time to chop a ton of vegetables, right? But there's ways that we can still do it and still be healthy. I eat, I eat them when I'm like driving in my car or commuting. I mean, there's all sorts of ways you can go about it and be creative. Okay, so that is the smile scale. I want you now to tally up your how you did today was your score anywhere from zero to five and be gentle with yourself so there's definitely days where my score has been a zero or a one uh not getting enough sleep being on call uh not getting enough exercise and then all the way to four or five i tend to feel a lot better when i'm a four or five when i'm a zero or one i tend to not feel as good so just think about how you're doing. You can share that. Okay, good. Some are sharing it in the, in the team. Okay, and no, no, no to be gentle about, gentle with yourself because my goodness, you're studying medicine and this is hard. And we're, there's so much emphasis on you gotta learn and you gotta perform and you have to do all these things. But know that your health matters too, that just having a simple way to check in with yourself, say, okay, am I actually doing the things that I need to protect my health? now and for the years to come can i build those things back into my life maybe someone's going to be super creative i don't i have not yet found a way i can do sleep and any of the other things but like if you can find a way to do uh like check a number of boxes at the same time that's why i do a bit of yoga with a meditation that's why i like to exercise with my daughter right anytime you're doing a meal with another person all that can really help so i am going to um i think that's mostly all that I have here. I, a, a few brief other things for just that journaling has helped me to develop empathy. Writing has become a huge part of my life and something I care about. I just want to thank you for being here, for taking care of patients, for being interested in compassion, and for taking this forward. So thank you so much for your time. We can, I know we have a little bit of time for questions. You can reach out to me by email. I have a website. You can um, reach out to me on Instagram. I also have a Twitter, but I'm not quite there where I'm active on that as much. So more, much more active on Instagram. And then I have a website, more about the smile scale. I've got some of my writing there and you can reach out to me at any time. So, okay, let me open it up just to see if anyone has any questions. If I could ask a question without typing it, if that's okay. Oh, sure. um, uh -huh. uh, in your hospital or in your, let's say, latest years of residency and fellowship, how has your yeah, your hospital you have been working at uh, tried to, let's say, better or give the doctors tools to increase this substantially or, or the empathy we have seen to decrease as time go by, goes by. Like what um, efforts has the hospital put in to kind of combat that if they have at all? Yeah, I think most hospitals, most doctors don't realize that this is an issue. I don't think they realize that empathy gets trained out of doctors. The emphasis is absolutely on doing the work, and there's not as much emphasis on how that work is done. I think in general, we all feel sure compassion is great, but I, I believe there's not there's not enough emphasis on this. Um, uh, you'll see doctors that do this really well, and they do it really well in an efficient way. And when you see that, pay attention and just understand that there's a lot of people that are doing it well. But in terms of like a concerted effort, We've seen that.
Um, I think a lot of us care about this and just talking about it, having the conversation. If, if one of you in this talk does one thing different or shows a statement of support to a person, right? Or just one simple thing, like that's a huge, that's a huge success. Um, and I just want to say that anything you do to show kindness to your patients, if that's, that's, there's always, it's always a good thing to do. And um, if you feel like I'm standing in this group and no one else is doing it, be the one to do it because that's the doc, that's how I approach it because that's the doctor that I want to be. And so uh, I see another really good question here about um, compassion fatigue. Um, so compassion fatigue is something you're going to experience. I've experienced it over and over and over. I typically experience it when I am on, been awake for 30 hours or so straight and I'm working in really with really sick patients. And so I remember as a resident, I would be awake, it'd be like on my 28th hour, my last hour of call. And um, I would be called for another two or three admissions in the IC, in, from the emergency room coming up to the ICU. And sometimes you'd have patients that were so sick and they would be on multiple medicines and you would just, there'd be part of you that would just say, oh my goodness, um, you know, my life would be a lot easier if this patient did not survive the night. And, you know, there's going to be parts of you there's not a doctor that I know that has not felt that way. When you are forced to, when you are sleep deprived because of your profession, and when you are faced with taking care of many, many, many patients, high volume of patients, and your, your own ability, like your body's most critical need is for rest, know that you're going to have thoughts that are going to be compassion fatigue. Some of that is because of the work and the volume of the work and the sleep deprivation, but know that we all experience that. We all know that who we are when we're sleep deprived is not always the same person we are when we're rested. So be an advocate for sleep, be an advocate for your peers and be an advocate for compassion. And to me, all those things are interconnected because when I am well, I'm better able to take care of my patients, right? And we're still gonna go through the work, we're gonna go through the motions, whether we feel, whether we feel it or not, whether we have compassion fatigue or not, we're still gonna do the work. But I think um, it's not fair to us to ask us to do the work when we're not the people that we are. Things that help me with compassion fatigue are learning who my patients are as people. So I have a patient that's that you know uh, is really really ill, and it's going to require another two, three, four hours of work. Getting to know simple things about them as a person, getting to know their family a little bit, those can all help you. That can help you with your compassion fatigue. Um, and then the simple act of having time away from the hospital to restore, to sleep, to restore your health, those for me are hugely important to kind of restore who I am, and then reconnect with why you go into medicine. So, so often you're going to rush through your days because you're going to have so much to do. But if you can pause and just reconnect with why am I doing this? Um, these patients are people that I care about. I want to help them navigate this, this illness and I want to be there for them. That can help kind of bring you back to be the doctor that you want to be. And know that, you know, every single day I walk into the hospital and I have an idea of the doctor that I want to be. And because of a million other situations, I'm getting interrupted and paged and I get pulled in other directions. Know that you're not going to always be the person. You're going to try as best you can to be the doctor you want to be, but know that we're going to fall short. And know, and every time this happens, just think, okay, how can I do that differently next time? How could I, I said that differently? How can I further and continue to be the doctor I want to be. So I just wanted to, I hope that was helpful. And I just want to thank you all for your time. Um, I see another, how do you balance your, and if anyone needs to go, we're over the time. So I just want to say, thank you. I'll answer uh, another question here. Um, how do you find balance between your work life and social life? And what boundaries have you found to be the most effective when, with dealing with your health? That's a really hard one, right? You're going through medical training and you have very little control right? Medical training is often this feeling, well, I have these exams, I have all this material to learn, you start residency, you have these hours that you must work to, to learn, right? We, we need to learn to be good doctors. Um, but there's, there definitely is a sense of loss of control that I don't always have control over my schedule, or the things that I'm doing. And uh, I think that the, if you can create some healthy boundaries, I think that's really important. If I'm off for the weekend and I have the family, the, the weekend with my family, then I try not to schedule anything in. I have a lot of opportunities to schedule things in. Um, of course, things like talks or um, research or all sorts of other things. And sometimes you have to do those things, but as much as possible, I try not to schedule things in the evenings when I'm gonna be with my family or having time to take care of my health or on the weekend. Um, so that's why this worked out perfectly that I could talk with you during the middle of the day where I, you know, had a break in my time. And I, I think the other things too are, can you, um, 
if someone is, you know, if you have the ability, right? So if you're experiencing sleep deprivation or that you don't have time to be physically active, can you advocate for yourself? Can you advocate for your peers? I think this has been a huge part of my training that I went to a residency program that was very, very receptive to feedback. They cared about our uh, opinions. We had this ability to anonymously evaluate things. I think you should always have the ability to anonymously evaluate something, whether that's a person you've worked with, because there's a lot of sexual harassment in medical training, there can be. You should have an avenue to be able to report that in a safe way. If you're experiencing some type of bullying or abuse, you should have an avenue to be able to report that and to feel safe reporting that. The same is true with our health. So if you feel like you're going through an experience in your training where you um, are just being extremely sleep deprived and it's not appropriate. It's definitely not appropriate in my opinion for medical students to be sleep deprived or residents. We can, there's ways that we can get around this that we can still take care of patients without having to um, make our trainees be sleep deprived. So talk about it. Say, I don't think this rotation works. Why don't we set it up this way? Why don't we adopt a night float system? Have we thought about this instead? So try as much as possible to be an advocate. And you may not feel that you have the professional security to do that, earlier on in your training, but as you progress through your training, if you feel that, like for me, I had, I knew my, my, I had good relationships with my chief residents and my program leadership. And so having these conversations, we have done away with almost all of our 28 hour calls at our residency program, because we felt it just wasn't a healthy, it wasn't a healthy um, recipe for us. And so know that change can happen, but it's, um, try to advocate as much as you can. And also know that this burden shouldn't be on you, this burden, and do all the hard, all the heavy lifting. And so try to find allies, try to find other people with similar interests and, and, and people that have done this successfully before and use some tips from them. And that can be a way to kind of advocate for your health and set those boundaries. And you have that as well in your university. I see that. So I, I, I think that's a way to anonymously evaluate. That's really important. If, um, if something is happening around you, if someone is being bullied, if there's, you're, if you're witnessing discrimination, uh, if you are experiencing any type of harassment, you know that you know your career is important, of course, but that you are a human being and you deserve to have health and you deserve to be respected. And so make sure that you report those things so that it doesn't happen to someone else. So I know we got a little bit off track, but those are also things that I care about a lot. So I just wanna say thank you again for your time, for being here. Your time is very valuable. Thank you for thank spending some of it with me. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. I hope you have a good rest of your day and reach out to me anytime. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, before, <laughs> thank you so much for the rest mm -hmm. of the people. Uh, if I can just share really quick uh, one more thing, it's just to let everyone know about the next few lectures that we have planned. Um, you can see we have two more events going on in May our workshop uh, for cultivating well-being during exams with uh, Mrs. Taslim. And then we have our big last event, which will be the Battle of the Specialties, uh, something you should really uh, <laughs> wait, more, wait for more information on, on our social media. It's, um, we're very excited for this particular event. Uh, it will be basically a talk with multiple doctors uh, explaining their specialties and basically will be kind of like a mini rap battle without the rapping part <laughs> on the winning specialty on which specialty uh, is the best. Um, here you can see our banner, but thank you so much everyone for coming. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Laura. It was amazing. I really, really enjoyed your talk. It was quite different to what we have had until now. So it's, it's great to experience and uh, be able to discuss more topics than just, let's say, pathologies or <laughs> other diseases. And yes, thank you so much for your time. I've left the link for our feedback form in the chat below. Uh, feel free to give us your feedback. We would love to hear it. And to whoever feel, fills in the um, form, they will also receive an attendance certificate. But yeah, other than that, I wish you a lovely weekend to rest well and uh, have a great day. Have a great rest of the day. That's it for me. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much. Have a good weekend. Bye.